Welcome to the digital podcast that explores how different organizations transform the way they create and capture value with digital technology. Nick, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to have you, and I really look forward to uh, having this conversation with you. Uh, I recently uh, watched, and I know you've been part of the AWS reInvent uh, talk, so uh, there's a lot of exciting things happening in the travel industry, and uh, not just airports, but also more broadly in the travel industry, and really looking forward to uh, uh, discussing uh, a number of things with you. So maybe we could start by you introducing yourself, your career so far, and your current role at uh, Manchester Airports Group. Yeah, sure. So my name is Nick Woods. I am the Chief Information Officer for Manchester Airport Group. We are the largest um, UK-owned airport operator. So we own Manchester Airport, Stansted Airport, and East Midlands. Um, we also own an e-commerce business with the largest um, distributor of airport parking probably in the globe now and and have a vision in that space to really expand into being able to deliver products and services right across the uh, end-to-end travel journey but for my own remit you know i am responsible for all tech across our all of our airports i look after cyber security i look after data and analytics and for the last 12 months or so actually probably the last two years now I've also been responsible for a group-wide transformation, essentially looking at how we completely reimagine our business, taking advantage of technology, but also taking advantage of, of, of the other you know, emerging trends um, globally, really, to look at how we can um, really leverage that to, to take the business forward. So um, quite an exciting place to be. In, in terms of my background, um, I've been with MAG for seven years now in a number of roles. I originally joined to lead the new terminal build that we've done at Manchester Airport from a technology perspective. And then I've, I've gone through IT strategy, CTO kind of roles before before landing in the in the CIO, CIO seats, which I've had for about five years. Um, if you go back further in my career, I spent six years or so with, with Accenture, where I was doing consulting services, technology consulting services, large infrastructure transformation programs and application modernization and replacement programs. And then before that, I was in telcos. And winding back a little little bit further than that as well, I um, studied informatics at Edinburgh University, um, where I really focused on computer science and management science. So it's a little bit about me and and who I am. Yeah, and quite a broad range of experience, I would say, um, and and different sectors. So... uh... I'm sure Mag is very uh, lucky to have you. Um, so <laughs> I'll let someone else be the judge of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to start our discussion by focusing on uh, what Mag uh, does. Can you describe how it is set up and uh, talk a little bit about the key operations and objectives across the various offerings uh, that you uh, manage? Yeah, so sure. So look, fundamentally, the, the core business is we own and operate airports. So, you know, as I said earlier, there's three airports in the group today. Um, they are Manchester, um, serves about 30 million passengers a year, a little bit less than that. Um, Stansted, very, very similar in terms of size and the, and the number of airports that, the uh, number of um, passengers that, that Stansted serves. Um, and then we have East Midlands, um, which, much smaller in terms of passenger volume, so it's about 5 million passengers or a little bit less than 5 million passengers a year, but is the only 24-7 cargo operator in the UK. So, you know, we have the full spectrum covering, you know, north, middle and, and, and south of the uh, of mm-hmm. the country. You know, airports make their money from three things, essentially. Number one, aeronautical revenue, airlines paying per passenger or per flight to come and operate from our airports. Um, car parking is a huge revenue driver for us. We have probably a hundred thousand parking spaces across our across our campuses, and then um, retail. You know, we're a we're a retail operator as well, in in much of the same way that a a shopping mall is. We have um, you know businesses like um, Jufri and W H Smiths and restaurants, food and beverage outlets that that operate as well that also bring income into us. So, you know, airports in their own right. Are, 
they're they're a city. You know, they've got absolutely everything in them. Um, and for a technologist, for someone like myself, it's a really interesting place to be because you get to play with a baggage system being in a manufacturing plant, a departure lounge being a shopping mall, a airfield being an airfield, right? Planes show up and you get to deal with all of that stuff as well. And then that's before you get to all the border security and the stuff that has to go along with that. So it literally is, it's a city. You get to play with everything and it's it's an interesting place to be. Kavu is our e-com business. That sits outside of my remit, but I work very, very closely with them. And that really is about taking products and services to um, to other airports as well as to MAGS airports. Um, so like I said before, we are the largest distributor of airport parking probably in the world, certainly in North America. We run lounges and hospitality facilities for them. But increasingly, we're starting to sell more and more products and services through that platform, whether that is car transfers, whether that is hotel services, whether that is, um, you know, lounges and fast pass and fast tracks and that kind of thing. Um, so it's quite a diverse uh, business, quite a diverse operation for the type of things that we do across the group. And and you've been with MAG since 2016. Mm. And in, we've, we've had conversations in the past about the key challenges you faced. Uh, it would be great if you maybe outlined some of those and then how you um, uh, manage to overcome those. I mean, maybe take us through some of the strategic decisions that you made throughout the process. Yeah, sure. So I think, you know, similar to many organizations, I don't think uh, MAG was by any means an outlier in this. Technology has been historically seen as a utility service provider. The business does business. It has ideas around things that it wants to do, and it goes to technology and says, can you make this work? We've bought this application. Um, we've set up this new line of business. Tech, we need you to provide us some some wires and plug it in for us and make sure that uh, it, it runs efficiently. Um, so we've been the tail end of the process, and Mag was very much like that when I walked when I walked through the door. Um, I said my, my first role here was really on that new terminal build. We've spent north of a billion pounds on Manchester over the last few years, um, essentially completely rebuilding Terminal 2. And what I walked into was we're spending a billion pounds on a new terminal, um, but had a lift and shift strategy for the technology. We weren't going to put anything new in, we were just going to extend what we already had. And I very quickly got to a point that said, well, what you've got isn't fit for purpose for the future. It's 20-year-old tech, it's data centers and networks that are going end of life. Um, You're starting to create some corporate risk here actually that doesn't mean that we're not going to be able to take advantage of of the things that we want to do so i essentially highlighted what those risks were highlighted the barriers and problems that that was going to have for moving the business forwards and then moved into the cto role after about a year to go and put that new it strategy together says well if, if these are the problems and the risks how do we go and solve it and i spent probably 12 months then looking at what was the right thing to go and do with the infrastructure? How did we go and solve for that? What was the application strategy? We've got a, um, or historically, all of integration was just outsourced. We'd go and buy applications and just say to the vendor, um, can you go and make that work? And can you work with any other vendors that you need to talk to to go and do it? And what we ended up with was a, a child's sketch drawing of um, integration points all over the place that meant siloed data stuff locked in that we couldn't get access to that was really holding the business back so we sold a strategy to board that basically said hey we need to invest in the infrastructure we need to completely modernize all of that we run hybrid infrastructure environments where similar to a hospital in a lot of ways passengers and bags and planes show up at our airports um, and we need to be able to process them and i want to be able to process them even if I've lost connectivity to the outside world. So we we run some stuff on premise, uh, baggage systems and the in, industrial kind of controls that we need for ground lighting and those kinds of stuff run better locally than they run in the cloud today. Um, so we, we, we've got a hybrid infrastructure environment we spent the last five years building out across the three airports um, and have just declared success in bringing all of those risks back inside of Appetite. And we set about an, an application modernization estate as well. Um, which was about A, bringing infrastructure in-house, B, getting a good handle on our data and starting to really leverage the power of data to move the business forwards, and C, then starting to pick apart the legacy application estate so that we could start moving to best-in-class systems, which in some cases we're buying, 
some case we're partnering to develop and in some cases we're developing ourselves because it differentiates us enough to be able to go and do it. So I sold that strategy to the board and, and then moved into the CIO role to go and execute that strategy, which I've been doing for the last five years. The pandemic slowed us down a little bit, but but not hugely. We recognized, I think, the transformative power of technology to help move the business forwards and help the business grow. And, you know, if I sit here today and look at Mag's plans for the next five years, um, next year we'll do around 60 million passengers. By the end of the next five-year cycle, we expect to be north of 80 million passengers. And if you look five years out beyond that, you know, we want to be north of 100 million passengers. So that's huge growth plans for the business. But to do that within the infrastructure that we've got and to do that within the capacity um, constraints that we've got of the, you know, the land spaces around our airports, we're going to have to do things differently. And technology is going to be a, a, a big um, enabler to go and unlock all of that. Yeah, and and it sounds like the the strategy really won you the CIO role. So uh, it, it, you really pulled it off. But I wonder, in terms of the actual transformation process, you know, convincing people that they need to do things differently. You mentioned that there's there were a number of different um, systems, um, siloed systems, uh, data not integrating very well. And, and obviously, a lot of these people um, across the the airport group. Um, we're used to using those systems, right? So how, how do you convince on the ground, how do you make this transformation happen? Look, I think first and foremost, tech-led transformation for the sake of tech does not work, right? Mm -hmm. And I inherited plenty of top-right Gartner applications. You know, We've got Maximo for asset management that went in 10 years ago. We've got SAP for all of our ERP. We've got ServiceNow. But they've kind of been put in without thinking about the business change that needs to go with them to really effectively go and land them in the business, have them properly adopted, and then to realize the benefits that the original business cases said would be achieved by, by putting in these platforms. So a fundamentally different approach was required to be able to go and make that work. We've been on a journey towards product management. And what is product management? There's two things for me. Number one, how is it different for projects? The product never dies, right? A project has a defined scope, a start and finish, and, um, and you run it. And then at the end of it, you close the project down and move on to the next things. Product, they live forever, right? Um, and... When we talk about product management, what do we really mean? We really mean that we partner with the business to understand long-term, have joined up strategy, joined up roadmaps that work together to actually jointly go and invest in delivering positive business outcomes. So we've been on a, on a journey towards product management over the last few years, really thinking about, A, what are our products? And the way that we describe them um, today is things in the airport space, Check-in is a product, the security hall is a product, the departure lounge is a product, the airfield is a product. And in the past, when we've approached projects or modernization activities in those spaces, we'd say, we need to upgrade the X-ray machine. Let's run the X-ray, let's run a project and upgrade the X-ray machine. Now we say, well, we need to upgrade the security product. So how are we going to change that security product? Well, we're going to measure success jointly. I'm jointly buy into ownership of that. And we're going to measure it in a simple way. So at the very top of the value tree for security, the, the three levers are, was it compliant? That's what it exists for, to stop knives and bombs and guns and things like that getting onto aircraft in the first place. What was the service level for that, um, for delivering that? How did passengers feel about that security experience? And what was the cost to serve? And actually, we can jointly, between the tech teams, between the operational teams, between the assets teams, sign up to shared KPIs around how do we impact on those three things to actually go and deliver the value for the business and measure them through everything we do, whether it's a small continuous improvement kind of activity or whether it's a major program to go and replace a part of that product. Um, as long as we think about it in a partnership model between technology, um, operation, and the, the delivery kind of capability that may include the assets or the commercial teams, you form those product teams together and you jointly develop the strategy, the roadmaps that you, you handshake on and deliver together. In my 
original strategy, and I've just launched my new version of my strategy a few weeks ago. Um, in my original version of the strategy, it was all about taking technology from being a you know, utility service provider to being a strategic partner of the business. And in my transformation team, Paula, who looks after my transformation as program director, said to me early on, we'll know we're being successful in this when the business are coming towards us, rather than us going to the business with, hey, we've got a great idea, we think you should do this. We knew we'd be we'd been successful when the business started coming to us and going, hey, we've got this great idea. How can you help us imagine what that might look like and deliver it and execute it? And I think that's the space we're now in. And and that's very interesting. I mean, it sounds a lot like uh, Biz DevOps, right? Uh, which has been taking on uh, in the last few years and agile development and all these things. And I understand the product-based management. Um, now, when you have multiple products, I, I assume you also have some kind of board that oversees the, the product management and, and how they integrate, how they come together. Otherwise, you run into what you were describing earlier, right? The the point-to-point -point solutions that don't necessarily integrate mm -hmm. across uh, the strategy. So how do you implement this? It's a good question. So there's two lenses on that that I will give you. Number one, our products don't exist in isolation. They exist in a wider journey or flow across the overall business. So if you think about the airport, back to the airport space again, there's two main flows or journeys that are driving the airport, right? So mm -hmm. number one is passengers show up, possibly in a car or on a train, arrive at our terminals, flow through those terminals, through the products, check-in, security, departure lounge, boarding, get on a plane, which I'll pick up again in a second, or they get off a plane and come back the other way on that same journey through immigration, baggage reclaim, back onto some kind of mode of transport to leave the airport. So we think about those journeys and map those journeys end to end and have dissected them or split them, I guess, into the individual products that we still think about in an end to end journey flow. So we have the passenger one and we have the aircraft one and the aircraft, you know, exactly the same fly to our, um, fly to our airports approach, come down, land taxi off the runways, go to a stand uh, and gate, turn themselves around and then taxi off and, and, and take off again. It's, it's just exactly the same. So we measure the effectiveness of those end-to-end -end journeys and we govern the projects by how they impact those end-to-end -end journeys as well. So we've, we've, we've not just thought about them all in isolation, we've thought about them in the context of an end-to-end -end journey and flow that we can measure and establish how effective they are all be. And in that you can say, well, what's my next biggest pain point? What's the one that I need to focus on next? My bottleneck is in the departure lounge or my bottleneck is boarding. I'm not getting people onto planes or off planes fast enough. So what can I go and do in that space? So we think about it in that context, but outside of that, you know, the good old thinking about things from an enterprise architecture perspective, how do things fit together? How do they integrate? What is the data flows between them? You know, we have both business design authority, thinking about the end-to-end -end business process, um, thinking about the strategy, the requirements and requests that are coming into us and whether they fit strategy and how we map those things out. And we have the technical design authority, which governs, you know, technically what is it that we want to do? What is our, our cloud strategy? What are the policies that we've got around security and segmentation of networks and all those other good things as well? And that's been a bumpy ride. They're hard things to get in and get right. And the danger is that you end up in a, you know, governance for governance sake space where you end up with architects that are sat in ivory towers pontificating on what the ideal cloud strategy is and how to go and do it without being connected necessarily to the reality on the ground that we are a very commercial and hungry business. We want to grow, we want to develop, and we want to be able to move fast. So finding an agile way to say, okay, we understand what the direction of travel is, but we're going to be nimble as we go through to really think about um, is this the right thing for the business and how do we architect it? And as we go through that, we design and build and lay out patterns that can then be utilized by the people that are following behind them. The first one might take a little bit longer to go and deliver, but actually the ones that are the followers of that should be able to move forwards a lot quicker. So it, I can't say it's always plain sailing and easy. It's certainly not, but there is a, a clear balance to be struck around all of that. And then the wider piece on that is ultimately we are all collectively measured by business performance and results, right? So if you go back to that model in 
um, insecurity, you know, are we compliant? What is the MPS or ASQ, which is the airport service quality? It's a, you know, international measure of passenger happiness, essentially, for, for the service. And what's our cost to serve on it? Does it meet the business plan? Is it delivering? You know, that that's the ultimate governance piece around where we're going to invest and what we're going to, what we're going to do and what we need to think of next. Yeah, and, and that's actually my next question was around those KPIs and how you define the minimum viable product in each case to then try to make all of those fit into the broader strategy, the broader cloud architecture, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I get the point. It's, 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 it's great to have this, and, and some of the presentations at AWS reInvent were talking about these ideal cloud infrastructures, right? But then it's always an issue of how do you implement those architectures on the ground when, when you are dealing with, let's say in your case, a five minute delay on picking up a luggage, right? Maybe problematic. There's, there's these KPIs in relation to passengers, there's KPIs in relation to aircrafts, right? Mm -hmm. in, in relation to how these two entities are flowing through your airport that, and, and obviously you need to take into account uh, some of the bottlenecks that are already there, right? So it, it, it's not as easy as implementing the ideal cloud architecture. I think an airport is a very physical space. So you don't build a terminal in an agile fashion, right? It's waterfall. It's just as waterfall as you get. You design a building, you build some, get some steels built, you put some walls up, et cetera, et cetera. So we are, we, we have a, a really interesting mix, I think. We're, you can still bring to any of those waterfall projects, you can still bring an agile delivery approach and way of thinking about things and design approach to actually uh, evolving as you go through those things. And, you know, you can't have a minimum viable product for, an x-ray machine, you know, you're going to have to put that new x-ray machine in and make it work. But where you absolutely can have a minimum viable product and think about those things in a different way is where we are really starting to think about how do we partner better with the wider um, ecosystem. You know, MAG employs somewhere between six and a half and 7,000 people today, yet there's 40,000 people that work at our airports. So the ground handlers, the security services, the the, the airlines themselves and the engineering firms that are maintaining aircrafts and things like that. There's a huge number of people that work work across the site. And what we've been looking at, um, you know, really extensively over the last few years is actually how do we collaborate? How do we share data? How do we better integrate systems and siloed processes for the greater good of both passengers and the businesses that operate at our sites, including ourselves, you know, deliver fantastic, efficient operations, where well, you're much more likely to give great experiences to, to the passengers. And ultimately, you know, efficient operations means that they cost you less and happy passengers means that they're probably going to spend more money. Um, so it's a win-win from a revenue perspective and, and the customer is happy in it all as well. So it's very symbiotic in nature. And the stuff that we've been looking at you know, that I think is a really good example of one of those minimum viable product kind of approaches. Um, we've been working extensively with Ryanair around thinking about how do we better integrate our systems to be able to provide information directly into passengers. And, you know, I'm sure you've been through it yourself. You've got one message coming to you from the airline via your app or their website. You've got a different message for what you're seeing on the flight information screens. And if you ask a member of staff, you might have a different message again around what gate and what time and is that aircraft on time. It's a big frustration for passengers. And actually, it's a big driver of stress for passengers as well. So the work that we've just done um, with Ryanair is essentially to, uh, we, we have built a new event-driven architecture, largely engineered in AWS using... Kafka for real-time streaming of information and data. And we've worked with Ryanair to work out what is the information that I have around standing gate allocation, around check-in uh, check desk allocation, around carousel information that I can directly push to Ryanair and they are consuming that directly and pushing it directly into their customer app. That same data that we're feeding down to the Ryanair passengers is the same, same feed that we're pushing to our flight information screens and the same feeds that we're pushing to our um, to our own workforce that they have carry around in their pocket um, to be able to get the information as well. So we're getting a real consistency now of, of information flow. Now, 
those three measures around standing gate allocation, checking desk allocation, and, and baggage reclaim, that's the MVP. The next step is for Ryanair to be able to tell me, well, how many passengers were they actually expecting to be on that flight? And I can tell them how many of those passengers have gone through security. So you're starting to really build up an information sharing perspective that allows a much richer insight around how do we manage that airfield space uh, or how do we manage the end-to-end those two journeys that I talked about earlier around passenger flow and, and aircraft flow. And then the second bit that we're building, almost separate to that, but then we'll, we'll provide us with much richer information that we can push back in again, is thinking about how do we optimize the turn of an aircraft. So turning an aircraft, you know, the analogy that we use is it's a, it's a little bit like a pit stop in a Formula One race and a, just a much bigger vehicle that you're changing the tires on or, or or having to refuel as you're going through it takes a bit longer to go and do but actually being able to get to a point that says right we've got a plan we understand what the schedule is going to look like for the day and much like a formula one race all the teams have got their plan for that race as soon as you hit the first corner the plan's changed because the cars are in a different order and you're constantly evolving your strategy to figure out what's the best route through this race now or for us as soon as the first aircraft arrives slightly late or pushes back from the stand slightly late we're into a constant replanning so we're building a single plan that we're doing in real time um in in using artificial intelligence and ml to improve evolve and constantly have um the latest view of it and then partnering with the likes of ryanair and others to be able to share information that constantly updates that plan so we can get the best version of what it can possibly be so that's the grand vision. We actually end up with a, a, a much more optimized airfield that's probably worth, you know, 50 additional based aircraft across Manchester and Stansted over the next few years for us, purely from having better insight and automation of data and collaboration between the airlines to be able to, to, to utilize the infrastructure better. So, But the starting point is an event platform that says what stand, what gate, what, um, what check-in desk and what baggage have you got? That's that's what we've built today. The rest of it's in process of being built um, to, to give us that grand outcome that I talked about earlier. I've heard you previously say that managing airports is a big data problem. And what you what you added to that um, through these examples is that it's it's not enough for you as Manchester Airport Group to collect the data, analyze the data, do the optimization. What's also important is then to work in partnership with your ecosystem partners to to better understand the problem, to dynamically change and optimize these events based model, right? Uh, because it's a dynamic space, um, you cannot predict everything that could happen, right? Uh, a small thing could e- end up or escalate into a, a delay in the aircraft, you know, passengers missing their flights, the connecting flights, et cetera, et cetera. And, I mean, there's so many things going on. So it's interesting that it's not just data, it's not just AI, it's also partnering with your ecosystem uh, partners and making it work together, right? And even extending that further, you know, that it's just a big data problem, right? Ultimately, what is global aviation? There are little boxes in the sky that you want to get aircraft into to go and fly through designated routes to get to the destination. And how do you get them there? How do you get them there in the right in the right timeline so that you're actually optimizing that you know global super highway in the sky it is a big data problem and historically if an aircraft has pushed back late in charles de gaulle we wouldn't necessarily know about that until it hit our radar and popped out the sky eight to ten miles out that actually the time of it we were expecting to land is different so we're working with euro control to actually start sharing um key data about flight schedule locally as are many, many other airports. So we're starting to collaborate and bilaterally share that I can then start knowing, well, actually, I know I was expecting the the Ryanair flight from wherever to land at this particular time. Actually, it took off early. It's going to land a bit earlier now. So have I got the right standing gate available for them to be able to go into, or do I need to need to go and do my replanning that I was talking about before to go and get it to somewhere else? Ryanair work off a basis of landing and turning an aircraft and having it away again within 25 minutes that's pretty punchy for a, for a for a large aircraft. So actually having that efficiency that you know, and it's going to be early and I can't park it and on stand 12 because stand 12 has got a different aircraft still against it, 
I'm going to move it to this one. And constantly doing that replanning and evolution is what drives you the value. Um, but then sharing that with the global network is then what gets everyone to be efficient and move forwards on it. Yeah. And and that connects to, to my next question, which is about um, future-oriented activities. And, and you mentioned how you have transitioned from legacy systems to more cloud-based applications. Um, you're building a number of different uh, things with, with your partners, including Ryanair and others. Um, and obviously, you have built some in-house capabilities, right, uh, mm -hmm. including AI optimization. Can you discuss some of those capabilities and, and how you are then thinking about using them in future activities with your partners? Yeah, I, I think it's early days on some of that stuff for us. And we've kind of almost got a, a three-level approach to it. If it is industry standard application that everyone uses that doesn't differentiate you, and the example I give there is, you know, Office 365, Microsoft 365, or SAP, who are who provide our ERP. There's no point in me going and building my own payroll system. It's not going to differentiate me. Um, so we're going to buy that stuff. And, and, and similarly, for some of the airport critical applications, if it doesn't differentiate us and everyone uses it, I might as well buy it off the shelf. But I will partner with those organizations to understand how can we work with them to influence their roadmap to think about where they can leverage, you know, latest tech, whether that's AI or other things to think about how we optimize things. So, you know, in the case of SAP, it might be helping us with generative AI to write job adverts and that kind of thing. And so, so absolutely we're thinking about it in that space. We then might partner more specifically with other organizations where actually we're really pushing the boundaries on what we want to do. And we partner with a company called Copenhagen Optimization, for example, that is essentially building that planning engine for us. So, um, you know, we know how to run airports, they know how to build some of these platforms and we're working together to think about, well, actually, let's deliver, um, you know, a new way of reimagining how to uh, optimize the security hall and roster staff and think about what lanes you're putting on time. So we're using our intelligence and co-investing with them to develop their product. And actually then there's looking at potential gain share opportunities around as we take that stuff to market where we've put IP and, and investment into developing the product as, as other organizations take that on board and can use it. Then there's a, there's a, there's a, a revenue stream for us that comes off the back of that as well. So that's, um, a way of doing it. And then the third level is well, fundamentally where we are doing stuff that is absolutely core to our business. We have, you know, the one of the first things that I did in, in moving to the CIO role was bring integration in-house, bring data in-house and start being able to really go and <clears throat> do proper data engineering, data science ourselves. And that has enabled us to start looking at, um, you know, well, actually, with, once we've got good data sets, we can start thinking about what AI, AI models do we want to put on top of that to allow us to do, you know, prescriptive and predictive analytics. Um, and the most recent example of that is we're working with AWS to look at using computer vision to identify things that are happening across the airport journey. So it could be someone has left a bag um, unattended that we need to go and get somebody to because it could be a threat. It could be um, thinking about the turn of the aircraft. Um, and this is where we've been doing some real trials on lately. Fueling has started or finished. The air bridge is docked or not docked. Um, luggage has started coming off. The um, chocks have been removed and it's ready for pushback. You know, so actually, how do we start doing that stuff? And that is what we see to that is actually there. We think there is genuine opportunity to start doing some of that stuff ourselves and in-house because um, it's cost effective um, but secondly it gives us the flexibility and agility to be able to pivot and say actually we've identified a new use case here so we're going to go off and look at that one now uh, on top of it there's a real war for tech talent i guess at the moment so how do you do that in the context of being able to deliver at pace you know you need to have that ecosystem model that what are the things that you're really going to double down and do yourself? How are you going to partner with people that can help you accelerate your, your development in some of that spaces? But also what are the things that you can say, actually, you know, that Copenhagen optimization solution is 50% there actually. And if we go and work on it together, we can get it hundred percent there over the next, over the next couple of years. That's the fastest route for us to be able to go and do that. Um, 
so it, it is a mixed model approach i think that we're taking to this that's great and and you've already mentioned a couple of uh, examples of ai automation but what about generative ai i wonder whether there are any use cases um, that are being discussed, maybe not at MAG, maybe somewhere else that you've heard of and you, are, you would be interested in, 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 in also implementing those um, in relation to air pass, airport passenger security, in relation to air traffic control, air, airplane landing, and so on. You know, there's some you know, fairly obvious use cases around generative AI in terms of you know, being able to think about your um, customer service and your sales kind of opportunities. So we are already starting to look um, very um, earnestly at enhancing the legacy kind of chatbots that we've used that have been pretty much rule-based, you know, if this is the question, look at this database, get this answer for it. But actually, how can we move them much more forwards to to, to really leverage the large language models now to um, with, with, with much bigger data sets to be able to go and solve um, problem points for passengers you know when passengers get airside flights get cancelled you need to be able to figure out what you need to be able to go and and do off the back of that so actually having ways via mobile or potentially via kiosks and things like that that actually you can interact with with uh, generative ai to go and understand what to do and solve personalized problems you know this was my flight this is my boarding card my bags are already airside but my flight's been cancelled i need to go back what do i do about it you can start seeing how those can um, be very interactive, but start generating tickets and actions and events back to the event-driven platform that allows us to go and decontrol those passengers and get them reunited with their bags. So we're starting to think about that quite earnestly. Um, you talked about reinvent. When I was over there, I, I spoke with a, um, a chap called Mark Jennings from from Tui, and he was talking about how um, they're using Gen AI to take as hotels and destinations share information about their environments and descriptions of their environments and things like that they are using gen ai to summarize that stuff down and make it into really readable and digestible content that they can use on their websites to support their their booking flows and their um their their, their advertising where they have to think about things in the same way from that perspective as well and then there's all the usual you know back office um, efficiency stuff that you can go and do it as well we're just embarking on a, um, a, a trial of Copilot from, from Microsoft, um, thinking how we can use that to improve productivity across our back office spaces. Um, but it is, it is particularly early days for it. You know, when you start talking about security, how can you use AI to help security officers be able to identify threat? We've seen evidence now that artificial intelligence systems can very much support operatives in being able to say, identify sharps and spend, identify threat items in bags um, and be able to do that at pace. Um, much the same way that you're seeing that in healthcare now, be able to show help radiographers being able to spot tumours or damage and uh, to body health threats. You know, it's very similar in the airport space. So the world's our, uh, our opportunity in this space, I think, at the moment. It's uh, it's very emerging, but there's, there's lots to go after. Yeah. So I want to switch gears now and maybe focus on what uh, MAG and, and the industry more broadly is doing to um, help achieve net zero. What, what is MAG doing about this? And, and apart from using renewable energy sources, what, what, what are you doing to, to achieve net zero? You know, for the aviation industry, you know, getting to net zero, getting to carbon neutrality is an absolute critical um, enable for us, especially in a increasingly environmentally conscious and socially responsible world. You know, it, it's a fundamental strategic priority to us. Um, we've just relaunched our corporate strategy and, you know, front and center of that is decarbonizing aviation. We were founding members of the Jet Zero Council probably 20 years or so ago now in the UK thinking about this. We were the first carbon neutral airports in the UK at Manchester and Stansted. So, I think we have been pioneers and front thinkers in in, 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 in kind of leading this. Um, we've made a commitment to be net zero on our scope one and scope two emissions by 2038. So fundamentally, this is a core part of our strategy and, and something that we talk about extensively as an executive team and, and to our board and to our investors. Um, what are we doing about that? You know, we are 
looking very heavily at sustainable aviation fuels. Um, we're in the process of developing a um, solar farm down at Stansted and are looking at how we can take learnings from that to bring into, into Manchester and East Midlands. Um, but for me, from a tech perspective, the things that I'm thinking about in this space is really about energy management, about smart buildings, about smart cities, around how can technology help to respond and react to situations on the ground to deliver a much more environmentally conscious and sustainable um, facility that actually helps us get to, to those to, to those um, to those net zero targets. So, the example I would give you in that space is that by understanding what's happening in real time, by having an optimized version of of the plan, I can start being able to say, right, well, actually, how do I dynamically replan the airfield into a smaller footprint as possible from a terminal perspective? So I know after a certain time in the day, there's only a certain number of flights that are going to be landing. So can I shut down half of the building? And can I shut down that half of the building and actually turn off the baggage system, turn off the lights? I mean, I've been turning off the lights for a long time, but actually being able to do it in a way that is fully automated to say, the last flight has left. The cleaners are going to be dispatched and clean the area, but as soon as they've completed their work, we're going to shut down the lighting, we're going to lower the air conditioning, um, we're going to um, turn off the baggage system or potentially just slow the baggage system down because it's only not needed for the next couple of hours and I know it takes more energy to start it back up again. I'm going to diversify where I'm taking my power from at this point in time because I've got battery storage on site, so I'm actually dynamically microgrid managing um, that energy consumption in line with what's happening in real time. And the event-driven platform that we're building absolutely has that kind of vision um, embedded into it. It's about thinking about, number one, I've got a, a, a real-time, always-on version of the plan. I know what's happening in real time across all parts of the business. Two, I'm properly integrated into my asset base that I can turn things on and off or be able to control them dynamically and intelligently. And three, I understand what's happening on the energy network so that I can... Um, so that I can switch to solar when it makes sense for me to switch solar, or I can go and restore and charge from battery. Um, one of the things that we've been discussing a little bit um, recently is around, you know, the concept of electric vehicles potentially providing battery capacity to help us run some of the airports. Now, I, I have a Tesla myself, right? The idea of me going to someone else's site and them using my uh, electricity to to go and run run their run their facility um, is not really where I need to where, where I want the, the supply to go, but actually if you incentivize me to do that potentially through a discount on my parking or through um, a gain share in terms of the savings on it, there's different models now that I think you start getting to that community ecosystem around actually how can we all help each other to be able to do some of those things. So say for example. I know I'm going to park my car for a week. Um, if we gave you a 10% off your parking and we said we'd cycle your car twice a day, but we'd guarantee to give it you back fully charged. Well, actually, I think that starts becoming quite an interesting proposition um, that actually we're saying, well, actually we can, you know, charge those batteries up when we've got good, good um, sustainable supply that we can go and change, charge it from. But then when that's not available to us for other demand on the systems, actually we can use the battery storage that we've got. So, I mean, they're quite experimental, experimental thinking, but over the next five to 10 years, do we think we could potentially get to that kind of thing? Yeah, potentially. And I think these little ideas and innovation are the things that are going to help unlock, you know, that proper sustainable future as we go forwards. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've had conversations with uh, people from uh, the automotive uh, sector and they were telling me how, um, for instance, automated valet parking and uh, the use of um, electric buses to move passengers around without them having to bring their cars. I mean, all of these things, all of these innovations are happening in airports, which is interesting. <laughs> uh, and I, I think it's, it's the perfect test bed for, you know, uh, electric vehicles, automated vehicles. It's an environment that can be contained and, yep. and you can use the underlying infrastructure to move these vehicles around and, and achieve net zero um, while, you know, reducing things like uh, parking spaces or uh, pollution from cars that are using fossil fuels, and etc. So I think it, 
it's an interesting test bed. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I'm sure we'll see a lot more there. Back to back to airports being cities, right? You've got everything, right? It's a great yeah. place to go and test and, and learn on, on, on a whole range of things that have then got, you know, a very diverse range of um use cases outside the airport environment in, in, in the wider uh, in the wider world. Yeah. I'm conscious of time. So I'll just ask uh, one last question. And, and this is about your engagement with the various stakeholders. And, and there's, there's a lot, right? There's airlines, there's travel operators, there's retailers, there's technology providers. And, and each one of those uh, has unique capabilities, but they also require unique incentives. And you have uh, spoken to that effect in some of your examples, um, you know, how do you engage them uh, in these innovative activities? How does MAG as, as an entity, as a, as, a, as a corporate entity, help to bring together these different stakeholders to push forward the, the digital vision? Um, it comes down to communication and engagement, right? Thank you for having me on the podcast, right? This is a great way to be able to get our message out and, and talk about what we're doing. But Fundamentally, it is about partnering. It is about whether that is partnering with our direct business, partnering with the ecosystem that operates at our facilities, or partnering with the global network. I recently joined the World Standing Committee for Airports Council International, which is pretty much the industry body for, um, for airports globally. And I now sit on that standing committee with a cohort of other forward thinking um, airport CIOs and technology leaders with some of the vendors um, that we collaborate. It's not a sales. It's not trying to help. It's not trying to figure out what we can do best for ourselves. It's about thinking about how we can collaborate to move the whole industry forwards. And it's the same with the big tech providers, right? You know, AWS, how can we work together to learn from what you're seeing in adjacent markets or even completely non-adjacent markets that are innovations that actually we can adapt and bring into our environments as well. So I do think it is around, number one, being very open and conscious around what other people are doing. Two, making yourself available to be able to go and have these kind of conversations, including with the universities, including with the business schools, around what the ideas that are coming up. How do we get diverse thought, background, industry expertise together to go and actually jointly solve problems? Because, you know... We're not going to do this in isolation. You know, sustainable aviation fuel is going to need us to work with oil and gas industry. Um, you know, if we want to do hydrogen, we're going to have to work in a different way. If we're not thinking about how we do electricity and optimize all of that, we're going to have to work with the automotive manufacturers that you were talking about before. So it is, like I say, for me, it's about putting yourself out there, being open to ideas, um, mm -hmm. and then having the processes to be able to say, Actually, that's what we're going to try. We're prepared and got the appetite and excitement and willingness to go and invest and experiment in some of these things. Not everything will work. Um, but if you have the right backing from your board and from the investors and from your business, actually, you can find neat ways through that. That's great. Nick, thank you so much. This has been uh, really uh, insightful. I've learned a lot. And I mean, you're doing amazing things. And I'm sure we're going to have more discussions uh, in the coming years. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about the new innovative stuff that you're doing there. No, really, really enjoyed it. Thank you for, uh, thank you for having me and a uh, very, very interesting conversation. I was actually speaking to one of your former students um, a couple of weeks ago that I randomly bumped into who used to work, um, used to work at MAG and uh, he was uh, saying great things about what you were doing in the university as well. So uh yeah, I've, I've very much enjoyed spending time with you. Thanks, Nick.